Um, our speaker today is uh, Mr. Dennis Lynch from Havering Museum. Um, and in spite of all the relics that he's got there, he assures me there is not one Rotarian in there. <laughs> 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 I'm sure you're going to find it very interesting. I, I have heard uh, uh, Dennis's colleague Helen uh, speak about the museum, um, so over to you, Dennis. Right. 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 Thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk to you today. Can you can you hear me okay? Yeah, all right. Yes. When, when I, <coughs> before I tell you about the museum, let me explain why I'm here. I, I believe very strongly, I, I was a teacher for 40 years, and one of the things that I found, one of the things that annoyed me was the way that we used to teach history. And we, we don't have any ex-history <laughs> teachers, <laughs> do we? Um, and, and I had history spoiled for me as a child, and now I'm making up for it. <coughs> and when I, when I retired a few years ago, I was asked if I'd like to go and work for Havering Museum. And we are actually Havering Museum. We represent the whole of the borough, not just the village of Havering. It's on our museum. Sorry, can I just check? Is there anybody here who doesn't know where the museum is? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's on the site of the old administrative offices of Romford Brewery. Where our aim is to celebrate the history, the culture, and the achievements of the people of our borough. It's not a brewery museum, as a lot of people did thought when we first opened. They thought we were Romford Brewery Museum, and they came in looking for barrels and bottles and things like this. Um, if you want the Brewery Museum, it's up at Burton on Trent. That's where the brewery actually moved to. <coughs> Even though we're not a brewery, I thought it might be interesting just to trace back some of the history that led up to the creation of Romford Brewery. And one of the first recorded breweries in this area was in Hornchurch in 1200. And it was connected with Hornchurch Priory. And the oldest public house in Havering is the Golden Lion, which is down by the end of Romford Market. I'm sure most of you have heard of it or are familiar with it. And um, <clears throat> they used to import hops from Flanders, and there were local people who used to brew sort of private breweries all over, all over the area. And then in 1600, a chap called William Coyes <coughs> was in charge of the gardens at Stubbers. I don't know if you realise that Stubbers was actually going to possibly be the Kew Gardens. That uh, Stubbers and Kew were, were similar, Kew Gardens developed and Stubbers didn't. But Stubbers could have been the sort of Kew Gardens of, of, of the area. And Coys was one of the first people who actually, he grew lots of rare plants and one of the rare plants he brought in and developed in Stubbers was hops. And um, interestingly, in 1640, they did a survey. There were five pubs in Raynham, three in Noak Hill, two in Havering Atabower, and 22 pubs in Romford. Hornchurch, <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, had its own brewery. Um, the only way I can describe it, if you're coming up from the town, you've got the road that goes up to um, Upminster Bridge on the left, haven't you? The road that goes up to Hornchurch. If you go up the road that goes up to Upminster Bridge, there's a row of shops that were built there, I think, in the 60s. And um, they were, that was the site of the original Hornchurch Brewery, which closed in 1925. <coughs> the Star Brewery, which is the old Romford one, that opened in 1709, and it was acquired by a man called Edward Eind in 1799, and then in 1845 he set up a partnership with Octavius and George Coop, which is where you got the Iron Coop. Um, it's not mine. There was a, uh, there's a theory that Mrs. Iron still haunts the museum. What? But there's also a theory that we have a few drafts in the museum. Um, 
the, then, then Einkoop actually, the two families set up another brewery in Burton in the middle of the 19th century. There was an interesting event in August 1888 where the brewery flooded and apparently lots of barrels were washed away and returned a while later by some very, some very um, rather shaky locals because the barrels were returned empty to the <laughs> And then um, the brewery actually at its height in 1970 employed over a thousand people and then in 1992 it closed and the equipment went off to China and the um, company went up to Burton and they were mixed up with allied breweries and now they've been taken over I think by uh, Coors, I think, an American company. So when they closed the brewery, of course, there was talk of redeveloping the site and one of the things that was mooted was that there was going to be a museum in, in the borough, but it never actually got going. And then a group of local people set up Havering Museum Limited in 2001. <coughs> They're actually, most of them were local councillors. And they set up, it was set up as a company. And eventually they got money out of the lottery. We got, altogether we got £900,000 from the lottery. And they also got £30,000 or so from Veolia, clean away. Who, who have been very good. I mean, I, I used to work in a local school and we got some help from them years ago to do a Millennium Project as well. And in May 2010, we opened the museum. We've got 12 directors, all volunteers, and we have about 70 people who actually work in the museum, all as volunteers. We did actually have funding to pay for a full-time curator. Havering Council were very helpful. They provided us with funds. We had a full-time curator and we had a development officer part-time for about three years, but the funding's run out now, so the museum is now run totally by volunteers. I'm not here asking for cash or anything, don't worry. <coughs> we open Wednesday to Saturday. We open about midday and we shut at four o'clock in the winter and we shut at five o'clock <coughs> summer. We open on Tuesdays for schools. So if a school wants to come in, we say come in on a Tuesday or we take them in the morning <coughs> before we open the museum. And we, we have mixed response at the moment from schools. We've had, we get lots of the local ones coming, the Romford schools coming quite a lot. And I mean, I'm doing, I'm doing St Edwards next week, I think they're coming in. We also open the evenings if people want to. We can, we've got rooms that people can hire out if you want to. We haven't become a wedding venue yet, but I suppose that's something we could think of. <coughs> and sadly, we have to tell people, we have to charge you if you come, because we're, we're a charity, we don't get any money from anywhere else, we've still got to pay for the lighting and the water and the insurance, and insuring a museum <coughs> is not cheap, I can feel assure you. I'll give you an example of a, of a day. We had a good day yesterday. Wednesday, <coughs> Wednesday is my day. I, 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 I do the Wednesday team. Theoretically, I run the Wednesday team, but if you met the Wednesday team, they don't need running. They, they're a powerful lot. And uh, we had a, a group of children in yesterday. We did a Victorian toys workshop yesterday, and we had a card-making <coughs> workshop, which we do every month. And we had about a dozen routine visitors, which was a good day for us, because there are times when, you know, we get two people might be in. And hopefully, of course, after today, we'll get another 50 or 60 people drinking in with all their families and their grandchildren. Because we don't charge for kids. We charge for adults. Children are free. Students and children are free. One of the um, hallmarks, I think, of the museum is the quality and the goodwill of volunteers. Last year, everybody was very, very proud of the positive spirit of the volunteers who worked at the Olympics, and rightly so. I speak from experience because I was actually one of the games makers at the Olympics last year, and I had a fantastic fortnight working at the Excel Centre. I didn't see much sport, I saw mostly doorways and car parks, but it was good fun. But the nice thing is that 
you see a similar spirit. I thought, well, I've seen this before. This is not just the Olympic spirit. This is the spirit of people who do volunteer, voluntary work. And, and you know, um, even on a sort of wet Wednesday in December, we still manage to keep up our spirits. Most of us are retired, but we actually also have a very, very large smattering of young people working in the museum. We've got quite a few students, and they make an enormous contribution to the museum. They do a lot of preparation for our temporary exhibitions. And I'm, I'm actually very proud that one of the students is one of my ex-primary pupils who now works in the museum. She's doing a history degree now, and she's come back to work in the museum. We sort of bumped into each other a couple of months ago and went, what are you doing here to each other? Um, <clears throat> we run quite a lot of temporary exhibitions. During the Jubilee last year, we did an exhibition tracing the links between Havering and royalty. We discovered that Edward the Confessor was the first monarch to hunt in the woods around Havering Palace. Henry VIII hired Anthony Cook of Gideon Hall to be a tutor to his son Edward and his daughters Mary and Elizabeth. And they shared a classroom in Pergo Palace. You didn't, I bet you didn't know about Pergo Palace. They were there with Lady Jane Grey. Mm -hmm. So you actually had four future monarchs all in the same classroom at the same time. That is something unique to Haver. I don't know how long it lasted, because Lady Jane Grey didn't go on too long. Did you? <laughs> okay. the, the last monarch to stay in Havering Palace was Charles I. And he didn't last that long, I did it too. <laughs> so we, um, we actually celebrated all the visits and all the royalty who'd been to the borough, right up, of course, to the royal visit about a decade ago, wasn't it, when the Queen came to um, the theatre and came to Redden Court. And again, I'm going to boast the guy who wrote to the Queen to ask her to come was an ex-pupil of mine. We taught him to write letters. <laughs> and we also taught him to not to just, you know, to write to the right people too. Um, during the Olympics, we celebrated all the sporting heroes of Havering. We went right back to Daniel Mendoza, 18th century boxing champion, and he was the man who actually tried to make boxing into a sport by he actually developed the art of defense. He was considered a bit, bit of a weakling by some people. And he actually fought in the dell behind St. Andrew's Church, in Hornchurch. And um, we went right up to Mark Hunter, who won a silver medal in the rowing. He was the chap, if you remember, who was devastated because he, he, he missed out on the gold. Personally, I think he was wonderful to get silver. And, um, so we've got him in the museum, and we had Sir Trevor Brookie opened the exhibition for us, and we made sure we had a picture of him in it as well, so he could admire himself, but he was absolutely fantastic. Um, earlier last year, we celebrated the artist's rifles, who were based at Hare Hall, and they, some of the, our famous war poets were actually trained in Gideon Park, in Hare Hall, in Gideon Park. There was Edward Thomas, I don't know if you know the poem, if I should ever ch by chance grow rich, I'll buy Codham, Cockridden and Childerditch, Roses, Pergo and Lapwater, and let them all to my eldest daughter. That was obviously written by a man who was trained in Hare Hall. Hornchurch Grey Towers was the home of the Sportsman's Battalion in the First World War, and we celebrate a gentleman by the name of Sandham, who was, I think, a Surrey cricketer and also played for England. Sutton's Farm in Hornchurch, that was the home of the fledgling Air Force, and there was from there, <coughs> Leif Robinson yeah. was shot, shot down a German airship and won a VC. I don't know if you know, but the ammunition he used at the time was illegal. It was an incendiary bullet, which was actually illegal. <coughs> Later on, Leif Robinson went to France, and the pilots over there weren't terribly impressed by his VC because they said he was sort of sitting over in Hornchurch taking pot shots at airships. And um, he only lasted a short while and was shot down by Richthofen. How am I doing for time? 
Number yeah. five, number bit. Sure. Yeah, good, okay. Next year we're going to celebrate 100 years of the First World War, and guess what Havery Museum's temporary exhibition is going to be? I think everybody, every museum in England is going to be doing 1914 next year, are they? If you've never not visited the museum, let me just tell you a few bits about it. Our oldest item is between 10 and 400,000 years old. It shows how good we are at carbon dating, doesn't it? Um, it's a flint axe found down on the Thames foreshore. And some of the younger items are a bit scary because they come from, you know, we've got a, a, a tape recorder. And when I first walked in and saw this old tape recorder, I thought, I remember wanting one of those as a kid. So it's a bit too close for comfort. <laughs> We've got five areas in the museum, Havering, Hornchurch, Rain and Rockford and Upminster. And we have a room where we, where we talk about just local industries, like the brewery, obviously, Ronio Vickers, Brox Fireworks, if you might remember some of you from your childhood. They were manufactured in Harold Wood. Bryant, Bryant and May, Bryant Avenue, chap who owned the match factory up next to the Olympic site. He had his house in um, Harold Wood. And in fact, I looked at your website and I noticed you support, supported Ravensbourne School, didn't you, with the project a while ago? And Ravensbourne School was actually Bryant's house. Mr. Bryant lived there. Um, we celebrate local entrepreneurs. I hope you've heard of Edward Hillman, who opened the first private airline in this country. And he was over at Maylands, where you've got the golf course now. And Hillman would fly you to... Um, Clacton for 14 and 6. <coughs> or he'd fly you to Le Bourget just on the edge of Parish for a fiver. And, back. and, back. Really get back and he moved up from, he was there in 1931. In 1935 he moved up to Stapleford Abbots and they linked up with a couple of other private airlines and they formed British Airways. Mm. Rumour has it that Dick Turpin visited Havering, although in fact most towns in England would claim that Dick Turpin visited them, so we're not, we're not making that claim. But we do have a really good villain, Captain or, it's either Captain or Colonel Blood, the Crown Jewels man. He ran a chemist's shop in Romford Market. <laughs> Are we chemists? Yeah. <laughs> 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 it was an apothecary shop. And you know, you know that there are lots of stories about him um, that when he died, they buried him at St Margaret's in Westminster, down the road from the House of Commons, House of Parliament. And his creditors didn't believe he was dead, so they had him dug up. <laughs> and they checked that there was actually a body in the coffin. And when they realised he was really dead, they reburied him. And rumour has it that they actually buried him in Hornchurch in St Andrews. I told this story to the local WI in Hornchurch, and one of the ladies got quite incensed and said, "We haven't got anybody like that in our churchyard." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm not so sure about that. But there is a, he is supposed to be out there. Um, local history down the road. You've got the the largest mill in, in this area, Upminster Smock Mill, that was built in 1803 and it stayed open and working until 1934. And um, I don't know if you're joking about at the front here on the main road you've got Byron Parade, the yeah. shops are they called Byron Parade? Well that of course was because Byron, is a, the poet Byron is supposed to have stayed there. Um, and in a house which was owned by the vicar, William Derham. But it was uh, when Byron stayed there, he stayed with a chap called Major Howard, who um, was killed at the Battle of Waterloo. And of course, up into you got the famous vicar of William Derham. He was the man very famous for his scientific observations. And with the help of a gun and a friend on a tower of a distant church, he actually measured the speed of sound and he measured it almost to the, it was, it was very, very close. And um, he also, William Derham, was very keen on recording the weather. And he, he, he records one day that it was such a hot day 
that two horses coming up the hill from Upminster Bridge, obviously up to the top of the hill, died of exhaustion. He also happens to mention on the same day that the same thing happened to one of his servants. <laughs> Did they sell the horses to Tesco? <laughs> um, right, I'm now going to wake you up. I'm going to finish off. I've got three questions. Okay, you thought you were just... I was going to, you're going to do some work now. Three questions. You're probably going to sneer at me for this, but let's just try you out. What's the only National Trust property in the borough? That's no, right. That's right. Owned by John Harl, who actually owned Rain and Wharf. And you know, Rain and Wharf is famous for the rhubarb trade. Did you know about the rhubarb trade? What they used to do was the king got constipated, and they discovered that this wonderful thing, rhubarb, was very good for him. And of course, therefore, it became very popular. And the place where they were growing rhubarb was was down in Raynham. And they used to bring barges up from rain and full of, full of fruit and vegetables up to Covent Garden Market, of course, up to the markets in London. And then they used to fill the barges up with dung and bring it back down to Raynham. And of course, they could grow beautiful rhubarb mm. on the dung. Mm. So there was this sort of <laughs> rhubarb <laughs> triangle, if you want to call it. Um, what's this, anyone know the name of a local primary school named after the inventor of the smart hire? Mitchell. Yes. Mitchell. 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 R.J. Yeah. Mitchell, good. And last of all, in 1831, Thomas Newcomb made a sale in Romford Market and he went home five shillings and sixpence richer. Does anyone know what he sold in the market? Cattle, Cattle. pigs or something. Man, sheep, man, sheep, man. His wife. His Angel. wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a little extra to this. He actually went home a bit richer than five and six because he tied her up and he flogged the rope for six months. So he went home six four. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> when you give a talk, know your audience. <laughs> <laughs> right, any questions? Yes. Any question of Dennis? Uh, Jim first, then Ron. Keep Just easy. one. We're quite close to um, St. Francis Hospice. We do a lot of some <coughs> Havering anti bowel. Have you included that in your study? In your, uh, oh, gosh, history? yes. Havering is one of the areas we feature. Anti bowel. Oh yes, mm. yeah, Havering out about. That's the music. Obviously, the borough's named after it, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And um, we've got, we've got a, we've actually got a dedicated spot in the museum just to Havering, mm. because of course you had Havering Palace up there, you had Pergo Palace up there, mm. because if you go down the road from the hospice, heading towards Stapleford Abbots, there's the Green Wall. Yes. And yeah. that goes round to Noak Hill. And if you walk round there, mm -hmm. there's, there's the last remaining bit of Pergo Palace, which is just a, a gatepost oh, really? in the middle of the woods. And that's the last bit of the palace. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've also got up there, you've got a unique Wellingtonia <coughs> Avenue behind the church, yes, yeah. heading across the top of, hay, of the park. It's a plantation, or an avenue of, of fir trees, Wellingtonia firs, I think they are. And there's only two in the country. Mm -hmm. One of them is up behind the church. Does it have and a significant amount of power? They all know that because we incorporate it in one of our sponsored books. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. so so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, what do you charge as an entrance fee? We charge £2.50 for adults and we do £2 for anyone over 60. That's all right. We don't ask <laughs> for it. <laughs> the, other, the, the other thing is, um, you never mentioned World yeah, War II. Yeah, you get an annual ticket. Yeah. You never mentioned World War II mementos, but I'm sure you must have a good supply. I won't put you in the busy We <laughs> We don't. We don't, actually. One of the sad things is that one of the most significant features of the history of this borough, of course, is Hort Church Airfield. Mm. And when Horn Church Airfield closed down, a lot of these stuff went to Perfley Heritage Centre. Now, if you don't know where that is, go down to the RSPB reserve by Rain and, Rain and Marshes. And from there, walk along the river towards the... Um, the, the bridge, the Dartford Bridge, 
and about a quarter of a mile, half a mile from the, the bird sanctuary is Perfleet Heritage Centre. It's open, I think, maybe on a Thursday afternoon, I think. You'll have to Google it or whatever. And they have got a lot of the stuff. If you want to see anything about Hornchurch Airfield, apparently they've got it down there. <coughs> Yeah, that's oh, another one? Well, no, another question and comment. Uh, you mentioned the old uh, Maidens Airfield, yeah. and I well remember going there with my father, because my father worked for Hillman, the actual Hill, Mr. Hillman, and we went there and saw the, well, I don't know if it's the inaugural flight, but one of the very early flights of Hillman Airways, mm -hmm. and that was from Maidens. Yes. There's, I think the plane he used, if ever you go up to Duxford, there's, they, they have flights out of Duxford, yeah. and I think it's the one they use, I can't think of the name of it, it's very similar to the ones that Hillman used. Yes, you say you had nothing from the Second World War, well I've got an air raid shelter from the Second World War in my garden and I cannot get it up. <laughs> 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 the, the, the short answer is thanks a lot. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, oh, brilliant. Man. I want to give a vote of thanks, please. Thank oh. President, thank you, Dennis, for coming along. There's a lot of things in there. Both, at least, no. I should say, seventy percent we didn't know about. Are you bringing the Speak up. Um, We've got our own historian down there, Ron. I mean, I think he was here when they were getting here when it started. But, uh, <laughs> okay. the, it's nice to know that this history is in Romford still, mm -hmm. where we can go and... I've never been to the museum, but um, I will make a point now of uh, going along. That's all right. Yeah, I will. But um, it's always interesting to be able to go and see the history of the town that you live in, and you've brought up, you know, moved into it, if you like. Um, and so, once again, thank you for what you told us. I'm not sure we've already got it, and uh, this President showed our usual way. Right.